say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert and my spirit is receptive to the living word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you take your seats, greet two or three people around you and say, I'm glad you're here today. Amen. Praise God. I'm, I'm glad you're here this morning as well. Today we're talking about more uh, on the subject of This Is Your Life. Uh, there used to be a program out there and they would come on and talk about a person and say this is your life and bring up all their history. But we have a history in our future as well. And we should plan out our, plan out our future as well as we can. Today I'm going to be talking about patience. And patience is a virtue that you're not born with. Uh, you have to develop. And it's something that comes at a price if you're going to practice patience. Last week we looked at how anger can hold you back and harm you. And we looked at all the psychological things and all the physical things that happen when you're angry or you're secretly angry or you're one of the passive aggressive people that like to be angry and make other people pay for how you feel. Uh, but you're still angry. You're dealing with that anger in different forms and different fashions. It may not be apparent to other people that you're angry, but you know that you are. And we're going to be looking today at not only controlling our anger, but turning our anger into a form of patience so that God can bless us and God can use us as the tool that he wants to use us as. So let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning, 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to start over in verse 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, and if you have patience and endure it, this finds favor with God. Let me pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we have been uh, called to this place here today to do your will and to hear this message. Father, I ask that this word would go out with power and with your glory on it and that they would not see me or hear me, but they would hear your voice, hear your word and hear from heaven for their lives here today. That they would be transformed. Them that are here, those that are watching live, those that are watching our television broadcast or see Seeing this in any other format around the world. Father God, we thank you for it now and in, uh, also into the future. And we give you glory for its delivery without interruption, Father God, and without distraction upon our minds in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. I want you to look here again in chapter 2. It says this Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. One of the things that uh, we may not be aware of that when these books were being written, slavery was still practiced around the world. There was uh, slavery was, if you own slaves as we found out that uh, we, we learned in the book, little tiny book of Philemon that there was a slave being talked about. And it was common even for Christians to own slaves. So everyone owned slaves, and if you were a slave, many times you were poorly treated. And poorly treated means you were beaten a lot, or you were hit a lot, or you were disparaged a lot, or you were not elevated, or you were left in the dark about many things. And if you had favor, uh, maybe your slave master would raise you up and would make you someone that would be important in his house. He would give you favor. Uh, he would dress you well, feed you well. He would speak well and kindly of, of you and to you. And you would have great authority and great power. You would wear a signet ring, on, and on, his, on that ring would be his symbol, and you could go into the market and buy lettuce and tomatoes and carrots for supper, but you could buy bigger things too, and you would buy it on credit because of that ring. And you would do all kinds of things, but many times people were beaten, they were uh, taken down, they were whipped. And we see this here, and we think in our minds when we're reading this, for this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. And we think somehow the suffering unjustly is in today's 
mindset is that someone spoke ill of us or someone did us wrong or someone uh, didn't thank us for something and someone didn't wave hello to us, that that is somehow we are being mistreated. And But when this was written, this was written with much more severe consequences coming to a person and then learning how to be patient under it. I'm going to read this again. Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Last week we found out that anger doesn't find favor with God. And in fact, anger is a blemish on a person's character. Anger can get you into trouble. Anger separates intimate friends. Anger destroys your life. Anger is a poison. It's an acid that poured into your body will kill you, will eat away at your body, will cause you to die early, will change the way you look at everything. Anger will cause you to make wrong decisions. Anger will get rid of your good friends and only attract the bad type of friends that, you, that could possibly be out there. Anger is something that you don't want to participate in. Patience, on the other hand, is the opposite of anger. When someone is angry, the Punishment doesn't fit the crime. Many times people get angry over very small things and they stay angry over it for long periods of time. Now, I happen to know a little bit about this. I remember one time when I got angry at Kathy and I don't know how many years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And I remember I was mad about the salt shaker. I don't know what I was mad about concerning the salt shaker, but I came home and something about that salt shaker wasn't right. It wasn't filled up right. It was empty the day before and maybe the day before that. And I got angry and I began to get mad and the Holy Spirit said, you need to settle down. And I didn't. I was angry about that salt shaker, I don't know, for 10 minutes. And I was yelling about the salt shaker and all my babies and my kids are around the house listening to dad go off about the salt shaker. I got sick. And I stayed sick for 24 hours. And in that 24 hour period of time, immediately I went upstairs and I, I went into a cold sweat and I couldn't move. And I had, I had pain all over my body. And the Holy Spirit said, forgive your wife over the salt shaker and I'll heal you. And I said, no, I'm not going to forgive her over the salt shaker and I'm up in bed and I have a fever. And then she came up a couple times. She, she'd come up, you know, kind of like what you women do. You know, you're like all, oh, can I help you? You know, and I didn't want her help, you know, because I, I was mad at her over the salt shaker. And the Holy Spirit, every time she came, I'd go, you want a glass of water? You want a pad on your head? Can I give you some more blankets? Do you need some aspirin? I didn't want anything to do with her because I was mad at her concerning the salt shaker. And you men understand what I'm talking about. You know how those salt shakers can bother us. And so after about 24 hours of virtually no sleep, of the sheets having to be changed because I was sweating so much, I was miserable, my body felt awful, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. You understand the picture. And the Holy Spirit said, why don't you forgive your wife? I said, okay, I forgive my wife. He said, that's not all. Call her up, call her up to the bedroom and have her pray over you for you to get healed. I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I forgave her already. That's enough. He said, no. So she came up. I said, God told me to tell you to pray over me so I would get healed. And then she laid her hands on me and I was instantly healed. And I learned a lesson that anger is bad. Right? Getting angry and under anger, anger, the punishment never fits the crime. People get angry and they turn the anger into something. We talked about all the different people that were angry in uh, modern society for the, maybe the last 20 years in the news and how people got angry and they murdered their spouse or they murdered, they murdered a fellow pastor down the street. When we're angry, we say the wrong things, we do the wrong things, we judge people and we make decisions that we shouldn't be making. And many times when we make those decisions, the funny thing is, if it's funny at all, is that the next day, even if we're not angry any longer, we maintain the decision that we made, even though it may be very harmful to us. It might be destroying a relationship or changing, in, changing a job or doing something that God never intended for us to do because we're angry. Patience, on the other hand, is interesting. Patience, what it does is that patience never seems to fit the situation. 
When you would expect anger or at least revolt or an angry word to be said, patience comes in and responds way less than the situation calls for. Patience is an unusual characterization, a trait that people develop over time. It's not something that comes to us naturally. Injustice, real or perceived, is bound to make you angry. There is a science concerning patience, and I, I went and looked it up. We looked up the science of anger last week. We found out all the things that it, it did, like 25 things to your body. It uh, hardened your arteries. It raised your blood pressure. It uh, caused uh, eye problems, cornea problems. It caused all kinds of problems in your body. On the other hand, the science of patience is this. Number one, you have better relationships. More people want to be around you. The science of, relation, of patience is this. More opportunities come your way and more opportunities present themselves. It's be, not just because people bring more opportunities, but because you see the opportunities as opportunities and you're not angry all the time. One of the other things also about patience, you get yourself involved in less battles. You're able to pick up and walk away from a fight and therefore you live longer, you're not angry, you're not uncomfortable and your stress level is down. So patience does a lot of good things for your physical body and for your relationships. Uh, when we're being asked to do this, what we're doing is we're emulating the conduct of Jesus. And he was beaten, he was rejected, he was put up on a cross, he could have debated, he could have came down off of that cross, he could have said to anyone in a room that was condemning him, he could have said such and such to them and they would have died, they would have fallen over backwards as we see two examples in the New Testament. And yet he did none of that and he went to the cross. Now let's go over to Genesis, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis this morning, so you might want to put a bookmark there. And we're going to go over to Genesis, starting out in Genesis 37, and we're going to talk about Joseph. Everyone say Joseph. Joseph. We're going to talk about Joseph today. Now it's interesting, uh, Joseph, and uh, you've heard me do these studies of how names have meaning in the Bible, particularly Old Testament names, and Joseph, uh, when... We think about that name today, and there's no J in any language until roughly the 13th or 14th century. And so there was no uh, J in uh, early English, there was no J in uh, Hebrew, there was no J in Russian, there was no J, there was no J in German, uh, there was no J in French or any other language on the planet. And J's are basically a recent invention. And so Joseph is actually Yosef. And Yosef means this. It means to add on to or to augment. To augment means to add on to. And Joseph was the 11th out of the 12 children of Israel. And uh, so Joseph's born and his mother names him to add on. Yosef. And again, the word play that we see happening in the earlier uh, verses, which we won't go to, is that I will name him Yosef, for he has Yosef uh, my family. In other words, he, had, he has augmented my family, this child has. Again, uh, Genesis 37, starting in verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. So this is the land of Israel today. Okay, And these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, the fa his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So he brings uh, back a bad report to his father. His father, right at this time, is in his 90s. Uh, and so uh, he's bringing back a bad report of all the other sons, the other 10 sons, now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a varied colored tunic, in other words, a, a striped robe, a striped tunic. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Okay, so just to stop here and talk a little bit, his brothers are developing a hatred for Joseph, and what's really cruel about this is he's the youngest in the family. 
Now, I have a little bit to say about this. I'm the oldest of nine children in my family, and I have uh, one of my brothers uh, is still alive. He's very tall, and he was born handicapped, severely handicapped, uh, where uh, he can't, if you were to talk to him, you couldn't understand him unless you hung around him for a period of maybe a couple weeks and began to understand uh, what his sound, the sounds were. He can't drive a car. He can ride a bike. He can work very hard. He's very intelligent when it comes to work, but he's very simple as well. And I remember when he was young, uh, he had club feet and some other problems. And although I was not a very big child for my age, I was very short, very small. As I've told other people, I didn't grow until the ninth grade. I was under five feet tall for many years. And uh, I, I just, I would just go crazy. If someone would try to attack my little brother, I would just lose it on people. And I would pull what I call the insane act for anyone that will used to be small knows what I'm talking about. I would pull the insane act and just go belligerent on somebody to protect my younger brother and also my younger brothers and sisters. Anyway, so I understand what it's like to have someone that's young in your family and the automatic desire to protect them and to really love on them. And, and, you know, you might call them the, you know, the brat of the house or something like that, but it's done in a, in a loving fashion. Here, these brothers aren't even doing that. They're not doing that at all. And look at this again. And verse four, and his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers. So they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now, this dream that he had was probably like a lot of dreams that he was having. Maybe not necessarily at the age 17, maybe 15, maybe 16, maybe 17, maybe over a period of time. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Now, I referenced uh, two books that many of you are familiar with. Uh, the book of Josephus. Josephus was born uh, right around 30 AD, right at the time that Jesus went to the cross. Josephus was a Jew. He was a son of a Pharisee. And he, he, he logged and characterized the entire uh, time of the first century as we know it, uh, but from a Jewish perspective. And so in the book of Josephus covers all these books in the Bible. And I was reading in here and they, they knew what the prophecy meant. And when he went and asked him, according to Josephus, what the prophecy meant, what the dream meant, they refused to tell him any more than what you're reading right here. So he would be persistent saying, you know, what does this mean? Brothers, what does this mean? He wasn't trying to brag. Then he has another dream. Verse 9. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I had still another dream and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and to his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Remember, Mary did the same thing when the angel uh, came to her. Uh, she kept the thing in mind. What's interesting about this dream, which is a prophecy, is that his brother Benjamin, the youngest brother of the family yet to be born, is actually prophesied about that Jacob, Israel, is going to have another son. His name eventually is going to be Benjamin. And uh, so it's prophesied that these 11 brothers are going to bow down to this one brother sometime in the future. And so here he is. He's having these dreams. Verse 11 now. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said, I will go. Then he said to them, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem and a man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field and the man asked him, what are you looking for? 
And he said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing. Then the man said, they have moved from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now I'm going to stop here before we go on to much more of the story. The story of Joseph, I think, is a familiar one. And that is, there's many times where we will have a vision or a dream, we will see us going somewhere. And I think it's the story of all of us. It's the story of our life. Many times we'll have a vision that we want to do something and someone will reject us. Many times we'll tell people that we're going to become something and people will reject you for it. Sometimes, ladies, you're going to say, you know what, I, I, I'm not married right now, but I believe I'm going to get married and have a wonderful husband. And whether, you have, whether you've been married before or not, it'll be a brand new thing. And you go to your girlfriends and you try to give them a, a word. You have this on, on your brain. It's not just puffiness. You're actually saying it from the Holy Spirit and people reject you for it. You might go to someone and say, yeah, I'm going to be a big businessman someday and I'm going to go here. You might tell people that uh, you're going to be a minister someday and you're going to have all these people following you. There was a time in this church, right when we built this church, this building, we had a woman in our church who was a prophetess. She still follows us. And she said, I see, and this is when we were in our other building before we were forced out of our other building. She had a word of knowledge. She said, I see wings behind the platform in your new church. Well, we have wings and I can walk back here and I can kind of escape from the rest of you all. And here's a wing, another wing over here to kind of, we have stuff hiding and we can go in there and, and uh, there's storage back there. And she saw this in a vision and she told it to other people and other people in the church said, oh, no, it's not true. But I just kind of pondered these things in my heart. And many times that if we don't reject God's best for our life, we'll allow God to speak to us. But that does not mean that people that hear about what God wants to do in you are going to accept it readily. Can I hear an amen? amen. They will reject you. They will attack you. This is the story of our life. This story of Joseph really is not a unique story. We've all been attacked in different ways because we knew that God was going to do something in the future, even if he wasn't going to do it right away. Now here, Joseph is 17 years old. We know from the end of this, end of uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, we find out and twice it said that Joseph died when he was 110 years old. So he's 17 now, and he's going to live another 93 years, and we're going to track him as he's living this next 93 years. We're going to track some of it anyway. So the story of Joseph is a familiar one. It's not unlike our story. Listen to this. The devil hates dreams. The devil hates vision. So too, if the vision of God, if it's from God, it's going to be hated. I was broke. I was in the military. Uh, like Billy Joel said in a song, I was an angry young man. I was very young. I was 18 or 19 years old. And I remember uh, going to um, some of my officers and some of the uh, ranking NCOs over me. And I said, uh, one day I'm going to be a millionaire. And they'd scoff at me and laugh at me. And I would come in again, not knowing that this would bother anyone. I was too young and foolish to know. I understand this. I understand Joseph being naive enough to tell other people about a vision and a dream and get a response completely different than what he expected. Because I've seen this happen in my own life. And I've seen this happen in many other people's lives where they tell someone else, something good is going to come to me. <clears throat> and you would hope that they would be happy for you, but they're not. You would hope that they would at least accept you for it, but they're not. They think it's bravado. They think you dreamed it up, not actually had it as a dream, but dreamed it up on your own. Great things take time. When you're talking about patience, you have to think about this. Great things take time. If you're raising a child, ladies and, and men, if you're raising a child and you have a child, once that child is born, you know that you're going to have to at least be taking care of that child to age 18. But I can tell you something, that I have eight children, and when they turn age 18, no one cuts the umbilical cord. <laughs> they still belong to you, and you still have a responsibility to them. Even if you had been through divorces and everything like that, you still got to see your children and your grandchildren and your in-laws and your outlaws even at the holidays. You can't get away from those types of things. You're going to be raising that child to age 18. And even after age 18, you'll still have a responsibility to your children. A great responsibility, God willing. And so when you think about how long 
something occurs, how long a season is, a season in your life can be a very long season. How many times, Kathy, did you call me and say that you just needed to get out? You were with the kids all day. We homeschooled our kids. She was stuck at home. We have a schoolhouse behind our home and a little tiny, you know, schoolhouse. It's you know, kind of like little house on the prairie. And but we had our eight kids in there and chalkboard in there and a desk and eight little desks for our kids in there. And she homeschooled the kids for 23 years. But there would come a time where she would just, you know, bust out, give me a phone call and say, I need to get out of here. This, this is, you know, I need to get another perspective on life. Let's go out to eat. Let's do something. I, I need to get out of here. And so we would do that. But, you know, the, the time frame that she was in, the season that she was in, homeschooling lasted 23 years. That's a long time. There's a lot of people that won't put up with anything for 23 days. And many times our seasons can go on for a long period of time. So when we're thinking about patience, think about this. Great things take time. And I think this, I think the greater the thing that God is bringing into a person's life, the more time that it takes to develop the person that's going to be moving into that mantle of responsibility. I've seen some people very young in age and, and, and all, all the glory goes to God for them being 30 years old and, and being the head of an industry or uh, being a politician and being uh, maybe the governor of a state or something like that. God gets all the glory, God willing. But there's many times God takes some time to develop people. Think about Moses. Moses was a prince in Egypt. He was a Hebrew, but no one seemed to know that. One day he kills somebody when he was 40 years old. And two people come to him and say, are you going to kill us like you killed that other Egyptian? And he runs for his life. But the first 40 years of his life was the developing of his education and learning to walk like a prince. The next 40 years, I believe, in the, in the back of the desert, raising sheep. And, and having a child was a developing time of how to be patient and how to learn how to put up with people that didn't have the same education level as you had and, and how to walk humbly before God. So that when he was 80 years old and he came back into Egypt and the people followed him out, Scripture says this, God says this concerning Moses, he is the most humble man on the face of the earth. And so many times, if we're going to be prepared for something, God needs to take time in you to develop you for you to become the person that he needs you to be, that you have the skill sets, the patience to develop those skill sets, and also the character nature that he can use to bring you into a place where he really wants you to be. I believe that in this room, I believe that watching television here today, I believe that those that are watching this message live or anywhere else in the world right now, I believe that we're all destined for greatness. But the thing that holds us back from greatness is not God, it's not the Holy Spirit, and it's not even the devil, but it, sometimes it's us. We're, we don't allow God to develop us into the people that he wants us to be. And there is a level of patience that God wants to bring us in and bring us through. And there's some humbling sometimes that comes on us in order to develop that. I've uh, recognized this. Remember what they said to uh, Jesus that he, uh, he comes into his hometown and they said, who is this? Isn't he the son of Joseph, the son of Mary? Aren't this, uh, these his brothers and his sisters? Who does he think he is? And they became offended at him. One of the things I've noticed about uh, families, and again, I'm the oldest of nine children and, I, and uh, we had eight children ourselves. Uh, one of the things about families and relationships in small communities is people see other people in that community as human. They don't see the divine in that individual. They fail to see the divine in other people. One of the mistakes that you'll commonly make, even though you don't recognize it, is you'll see someone else that you know a lot and you'll begin to see a calling developing on their life. And if you're not careful, all you'll see is the human. You won't see the divine. And you'll miss it completely. And so when you see them coming up and see them coming up, instead of being happy for them, you'll be angry at them because they're either prospering above you or they're moving above you or God's elevating them in ministry above you or they're doing something great in the kingdom or they're doing something great in politics or in society. And you, they're moving up and they're moving up and they're doing it with some, there, there's a certain amount of ease that they're moving into to get it done. 
And if you don't see the divine in them, if you don't see the providence of God working through them, if you don't see the Spirit of God, the candle of the Lord, moving them to do what they're doing, then you can get angry and you can ask, you can go even go to God and complain, you know, why are you doing that in them and not in me? Because you don't see the divine in them, just like they didn't see the divine in the Messiah, Jesus, in the earth. And we can miss it completely. And we can miss what God is doing. Who does God use in the earth? God can certainly use angels. He uses them all the time. Are not, you know, his angels will lift us up lest we dash our foot against a stone. We know that from Psalm 91. But God doesn't use angels to move ahead the gospel. He doesn't use angels to raise your children. He doesn't use angels to feed them and to mow the grass. He uses you to take care of all those things. He doesn't use angels to give the church and to fill the seats. He uses you to do those things. Your hands are God's hands. And whenever you put your hands to the plow for the kingdom of God, whenever you put your hands to work for the kingdom, you are doing God's will. You are doing God's work. And many times then you become, you step out of your ordinary self you step out of being ordinary and human and you move into God's purposes, which makes you in that moment in time and in that purpose, it makes you divine. Not God, but it makes you divine. It makes you a purpose of God, an instrument of God in the earth. And many times people will miss that instrument being used in you. Many times people will miss God in you at that period of time. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So people will see you as human. How many other people wanted to kill other people? We're going to see something here in a moment. But I, want, I want to show you this. Notice this, that Nimrod tried to kill Abraham. Esau tried to kill Jacob. Joseph, and we're going to find out in a, mo in a moment, his brothers tried to kill him. Herod tried to kill Jesus by killing all the boys in that particular area that were two and under. Let's continue on now, starting in verse 18. Now, when they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. By the way, according to the book of Jasher and also Josephus, which are two uh, extra biblical books concerning this time frame, uh, both of them say uh, conclusively that they had plotted for some period of time to put him to death. Not only now are they plotting uh, to harm their youngest brother, do they hate their younger brother, but they want to put him to death. Again, I, this is a crime against humanity that just boggles my mind because I was the oldest of nine brothers and sisters. I, 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 you know, I have five sisters and three brothers, and, and to, just to think that someone would want to harm the youngest one in the family boggles my mind, which tells me this, that anger makes people insane. Anger takes a, a normally rational person and it turns them into an insane decision maker. It causes them to make decisions that are irrational, particularly for this group, because they knew the providence of God. They knew the practices of God and that murder was illegal before God. They knew it was illegal. They knew it was something that they were going to pay a price for. They knew the discussion of Cain. This was before Moses. But they knew the price that Cain had paid for killing his own brother. And they knew it was an insane act. They knew it was something that they shouldn't be practicing. And they hated him even all the more. Verse 19. And they said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Now then, let us come and kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say a wild beast has devoured him. Let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, who's, by the way, Reuben's the oldest, Reuben heard this and rescued it out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into the pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay his hands on him and that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So secretly, Reuben was going to go back to the pit. It, they put him, they ended up putting him in a pit with no food, no water. And Reuben was planning on secretly going back to get him out of the pit and, and restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. This has got to be one of the most startling verses in the Bible. They threw him into a pit, then they just sat down to eat. It's bizarre how anger 
can turn you into a person that no one recognizes. And if their brothers had, had been rationally thinking and been walking in more patience and more love to their younger brother, they wouldn't have sat down to eat. They would have been milling around. They would have been nervous. They would have been twitching. They would have been doing all kinds of things of a guilty person. But sitting down to eat doesn't sound like any of them had a twinge of guilt. Are you with me? Verse 25 again, and they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, the caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened. Then some of the Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and pulled Joseph up, lifting Joseph out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, they didn't need the money, by the way. Uh, it was known uh, both in Josephus and also in Jasher and other writings that uh, uh, Israel was, and his family was exceedingly wealthy. So they sold him to make it look like a legitimate sale, like he was a legitimate slave, not because they really needed the money. All right, so they just did that to do it. Verse 29, now Reuben returned to the pit and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments because he was not around when he was sold. He actually went off after the meal. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the varied color tunic and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether this is your son's tunic or not. Of course, they knew whose it was. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph was, has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on on his loins and mourned for many days. And then his sons, all his sons and daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I'll go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's office, the captain of the bodyguard. And we find out from other writings, too, he's also uh, the chief uh, cook uh, over all of Egypt. Now, a couple things that we're finding out right here. First of all, Joseph is 17 years old. His brothers sell him and he's sold not as a, a slave to work in the fields, but a slave to work in Potiphar's own house. We find out that he, they take the cloak back knowing that he's alive. And not only does anger sell their brother off and get rid of the brother. And the reason why they got rid of him, they didn't want to hear about the dream anymore. But they actually hated him, their brother, so much that they lied to their father and let their father grieve for years. Probably, from what I can tell, anywhere from 12 to 14 years before he finds out that he's actually alive. Who would do that to their parents? But because these sons, these boys were not, were walking in anger and were not walking in love to their younger brother, injuring other people as a result of just injuring that one person was absolutely necessary. It's interesting to note, too, the archaeologists have found repeatedly uh, the bones and the fossil record of both lions and bears living in what we know as Israel today. We know that David came out, he made a statement. He said, I've killed the lion and the bear and this Philistine shall be like one of them. So even David had to defend the flock from lions and bears. Now, I don't know what happened last night, but there was this movie on, this uh, black and white movie about a zoo and they had that Clarence the Friendly Lion actor line come out. And it's, I had just done all this studying and I was just kind of winding down for about five minutes before I, you know, I went to sleep and I'm watching this giant lion on this program and it scared me. The mane is out, way out to here. This lion has been trained to be tame, but it's still a wild animal. I cannot imagine living in an area where you, didn't, you couldn't travel by yourself because bears and lions would kill humans, and so you had to travel in groups to stay alive. There are places in the country now because of this resurgence of, of allowing wolves back in uh, and let, letting them go where you can't travel by yourself any longer. You actually have to take people with you. Even in Yellowstone now, we used to go to Yellowstone for years, 
and they didn't allow you to bring in guns. If you had a gun in your RV or your car, you had to check it in or check it in before you got into the park. Now they encourage you not only to bring in guns, but wear them while you're hiking in the backcountry. My wife and I, we hiked in the back country when we were first married. We hiked around in the back country for five and a half days. We went, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 miles, and we saw six people. We didn't carry guns then, but if we were to go into that back country now because of all the wolves in the park, the 2,400 wolves in that park, we'd have to carry sidearms just to stay alive. And that's what was going on in Israel at that time, in the land of Canaan. It's being called Canaan here, but it's the land of Israel. And so it's easy... They, they didn't say he died by a lion or by a bear. They just let the father come to his own conclusions, however wrong. And they never told him not all the years that Joseph was in Egypt. Let's follow this a little bit longer. Let's go over to uh, chapter 39. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And Yahweh was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. If you don't uh, pause and when you're reading many times an Old Testament scripture or anywhere, you can go past a very important thing. First of all, we find out in verse 2, Yahweh was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, right? When God is with you, success will follow you. When God is with you, success will follow you. But what is one of the things that you're going to have to learn in this age, as Joseph was beginning to learn, is you're going to have to learn to be patient. You're going to have to learn to let God take you through a training time where when he gives you something great, you don't destroy God's name. You don't destroy the name of Messiah, Jesus. You don't, make, you don't become a blemish on Christianity. And you don't destroy yourself and your family through what the greatness that he wants to give you. God does, in fact, want to bless his people. But there's got to be a time of training, which on your part will mean patience on your part. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, Now his master saw that Yahweh was with him and how Yahweh caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant and made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. And it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus Yahweh's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. Again, we create geographical blessings as Christians today. We create a geographical blessing where we work. If you're not causing your company to prosper that you're working for, you're either missing it or you're not believing God enough. You should be bringing a blessing to where you work. You should be bringing a blessing to your neighborhood. You should be bringing a blessing to your school system if you're on the board. You should be bringing a blessing to the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, whatever you're in. You should be bringing a blessing to every environment that you're in, whether you're accepted or not. Because God's blessing will follow Christians that are out there. And wherever you go, God will follow you if you let him. And if you don't reject him in what you're doing, God will bless you in those areas. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, so he left everything in, in, he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. All right, so he's tall, he's good looking, he's got a nice beard, great hair. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here and with my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day. I'm going to go on in after day. 
And he did not listen to her to lie uh, beside her or to be with her. It's interesting that Joseph was in this house for roughly 11 to 13 years. And so this went on day after day and year after year. And we talk about this man. Not only does he have a big house, but he has servants that Joseph is ordering around. Slaves that Joseph is over. He's ministering to all these people. He's telling people about his God. He's running the household. He's wealthy. He's dressed exceedingly well, but he's not in his own country. And this woman is bothering him and he keeps resisting the temptations that this woman keeps throwing in front of him, knowing that someday that he's going to be elevated even from where he's at right now, probably remembering back the vision, probably remembering back the dream. But when you're going through these daily trials and tribulations and temptations, it's not easy to remember back to the vision that you once had. Many times your mind can get clouded from the different temptations that come your way and the devil will see to it that he puts stones to trip over, stumbling blocks in your path to try to get you away from your vision and get you to walk away in, a, in a, probably a sinful nature to walk away from the calling and the dream that God has for your life. Are you with me here this morning? And these are the things that Joseph is going... So, you know... <laughs> Lust is a big thing. It's a big thing today. It was a big thing back then. That hasn't changed. We as humans have not changed. And so he's resisting all these things. And he's doing it for long periods of time. And it comes up to be roughly about the time where he's 28 years old. And she says, I had it with you. You've been resisting me long enough. If you do it one more time, I'm going to come up with a plan. So she begins to concoct the plan, and we can see that plan being fulfilled right here. Verse 11, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household were there inside. She caught him by the garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment with her and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of the house and said, see, he has brought in a Hebrew to make sport of us. He came in to lie with me, and I screamed. And when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke with him these words, the Hebrew slave who you bought came into me and to make sport of me. And I raised my voice and I screamed and he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. But Yahweh was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because Yahweh was with him and whatever he did, Yahweh made to prosper. Well, I need to talk about this. There's a lot going on here and, and maybe you've heard a story or two about this section of your Bible. First of all, Joseph had it going good. And Potiphar comes back in and does not cross-examine Joseph, which he should have done. And I'm sure if Joseph was still an angry young man or was ever an angry young man, that he would have questioned and said, well, why don't you ask me my opinion? He never seemed to defend himself. There doesn't seem to be an opportunity in everything I read in Josephus and in Jasher concerning the situation. He never gives a defense because and he's never asked for one. And so he's just thrown into the jail. We know that this woman was plotting against him for some period of time and she was getting more and more angry about him putting her off. And so she plotted now, now to destroy him. So here he goes with a calling on his life, yet he's in a jail. And even in the jail, God is prospering him. But how can you prove to your friends outside? How many friends do you think he made? How many business friends did he make in Potiphar's house? Maybe hundreds and hundreds of friends. People that respected him and looked up to him. And all of a sudden now, he's down in the jail. And we can read here that the jailer let him do whatever he wanted to do. But he's still being humiliated. 
He's still down in a place where it's dark and it's low. He couldn't have any of his friends come and visit him and go, well, how's it going today? I hear that you're doing everything down in the jail. A person looking at this individual will say, there has got to be something hidden in his life that's sinful and that's wrong. And that's why it's up and down and up and down and in and out. And yet God's hand was still upon him. There have been times I know in your lives where you have suffered a trial or a tribulation. It didn't go the way that you expected it. It didn't go as smoothly as you wanted it. And other people were looking at you going, oh, whoa, how's that Christianity thing working for you? And you need to need that kind of help because you are already thinking that. Because the devil had already put it into your mind. Well, this Christianity thing is not working for you. This prayer thing and using the name of Jesus doesn't seem to be working for you. And you're beginning to think now, you're beginning to think like the devil. Maybe the vision for my life isn't real. Maybe the future that God has for me isn't going to be all that good. Maybe what I really want is never going to come to pass. And you begin to put a negative paint on everything that you're thinking about. You painted everything black, everything dark. And you do it on your own. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. But it's not what God wants you to do. What God wants you to do is to begin to walk in patience. And even if you're in a dark time, even if you're in a low time, Know that God is going to bring you out. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> if you think it's over, you're wrong. You've made a mistake. And the higher the call on your life, the bigger the giants will be to take you down. And they, the big giants don't wait for you to become a big giant yourself. They try to kill you when you're a boy. Just like these older brothers did. Let's kill him now. Just like Herod tried to do to Jesus when he was two years old. These devils don't play fair. They try to beat your brains in and you think, well, God, give me a break. God has given you a break. But sometimes there is warfare going on that you have to press through. And the reason why you're not getting all the victories maybe that you wanted to get, number one, is number one, you need development. Number two, you need to stay in the word and not drift away from God. Many times, too many times people begin to drift and they begin to drift and sure enough, you don't see them anymore. Uh, what's, the, what's the matter with you? I don't know. Got so many things happening in my life. And, and you know, I, I, we see people at gas stations, grocery stores all the time. They've drifted completely away from God. They still love us. Some of them claim to watch us on TV and watch us live. But they're not in the word. They're not hearing the word. They're not being disciplined by the word. And they're not being encouraged by the word when they're in a trial. And you can't be, you can't be encouraged by the world. You can only be encouraged by the word. That's the only encouragement I get. And I can tell you, I've been getting all tons of encouragement. And my wife said, what scripture have you been reading lately? I was doing some stuff. I'll read it for you. I was doing some stuff. She goes, you've been in that scripture a lot, haven't you? I said, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he had a dream. What ends up happening? He's imprisoned. He has two men come to him with a dream. The chief ba baker and, and the chief uh, cup holder. One of them, three days later, one of them's elevated and the baker is hung. And he said, when, when you come and all these things come to pass, get me out of this place. But they forgot about Joseph and left them in the prison. You ever been forgotten about? You ever do something good for people and they walked away and they forgot about you? You gave, you gave them the best. You gave them the top 20% of who you are and what you have. And they walk away and they go, ah, nah, thanks, whatever. They've forgotten about you. That's what happened to Joseph. And they forgot about him. They left him in the jail for two years. Now, all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a dream. And he has a dream of these seven fat cows. And they grew exceedingly fat. And then the dream ended. Then he had another dream. And then there were these seven lean cows. And then the dream ended. Finally, all the people in the land come and try to interpret the dream, but no one can seem to figure it out. So all of a sudden now, the chief cup holder says this, I remember a guy back in the jail. Let's bring him out. So they bring him out. They clean him up. They shave him. Make them bathe, put on a good robes, and they come before Pharaoh. And he says, Pharaoh, I can interpret the dream. This is the short and the long of it. I can interpret the dream. The two dreams that you had are, in fact, one dream, not two. He said, the seven fat cows, are, you're going to have seven great years of prosperity. You're going to have food coming in and food coming in. 
And he said, at the end of those seven years, you're going to have seven lean years. You're going to have destitution and you're going to have famine in the land. And he said, this is what you need to instruct your leaders and your elders to do. He said, you go and store all that food for the first seven years. And when the seven lean years come, you let that food go. And then he gives Pharaoh another prophecy and said, if this thing happens today, then you know what I'm telling you is true. And if it doesn't, you know that I'm, what I'm telling you is not true. And another prophecy came to pass. Again, this is in Josephus. And all these things came to pass. So Pharaoh comes back and said, I believe that you're right. We read it all together in our Bible. But Pharaoh comes back and he says, you know, I know that you're right. And not only if you had the dream and the interpretation to the dream, then I'm going to give you charge over this. He ends up being second only to Pharaoh. And he's 30 years old. 30. But he had been hated by his brothers for years at age 17. He'd been in Potiphar's house and doing good, but then chased around by his wife, which was torture. Then he had been in prison, lost all of his friends, made new ones down in the prison, and now all of a sudden he gets lifted out again. And I can imagine all the people that thought he was dead. He's away from his family. He's away from his father, whom he loved. He doesn't even know that he has another younger brother from the same mother, Benjamin. He doesn't know any of that information. He's been robbed. His father's been robbed. His father now is going through all this misery for years. If you were a man that heard, that loved this boy and saw how righteous he was and how well groomed he was and how intelligent he was and how beautiful he was, even at age 17, and he's killed, you would begin to wonder if God was really protecting you. And yet Jacob's sons let him believe that. And can you imagine the discussion that he had? Uh, yeah, boys, just go and do what you do. My youngest son uh, that I really love was taken from me. I don't care what happens to you guys. Then what happens now if you have another child? You get overly protective. Benjamin's born. You don't let him go anywhere. And in fact, we find out that to be true because later on, the 10 sons come down into Egypt to buy food. Joseph is there. He immediately recognizes him, but they don't recognize him because he's clean shaven as an Egyptian. He's not letting his hair grow out like a, like a Hebrew. They don't recognize one another. He conceals his looks and his personality and his, and his person to his brothers. And he says, bring back Benjamin. But Jacob won't let him come back because ben, he doesn't want to see another one of his boys from that wife die. Man, all kinds of bad things are happening, and yet good things are happening. And it's hard to see the good things from all the bad things happening in your life. How many good things that have happened in your life in 2018 that were really quite good? Did you get a pay raise? Did you get a new job? Have things gone better for you in 2018 than they did in previous years? Are things coming together for you more than ever before? Has God touched you in a way? Did you get married? Did you have a child? Did you start a company? Did some things end? Did some seasons end that were awful and God start you out in a brand new season? It's hard to see the good things when you have the natural things happening around you. We get to read it in the Bible, but we have to read it for how it's really meant. That in the midst of the trials and tribulations, God wants patience in you. God wants you to be groomed for your next stage of your life. God wants to make sure you're not going to mess it all up and put a, a, a blot on the kingdom of God because you weren't ready for the next stage. When you're ready for the next stage, when you mature yourself enough, when you take away the crying eyes, when you take away the immaturity, when you take away the anger, particularly the anger, and directing it at God or any of God's servants, those that might be leaders in the kingdom around you, then God can move you up to the next platform. He can promote you to the next platform. What ends up happening? For seven years, it's good. Joseph stores all the grain. He ends up, what you don't know, what you don't read in the Bible, that he, he ends up buying all the land for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh owns almost all of Egypt by the end of the seven lean years. He sells the grain back to the people, plus people from other nations give him wealth. Even, even, the, even Israel's sons come down and try to give him money. And of course, they all get reunited. I have some couple closing scriptures I want you to think about. So through all this, Joseph was never seen as losing his patience 
We never read about him getting angry. We never read about him even getting angry at his brothers. I'm going to take you to some things. Uh, go over to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse 3. Trust in Yahweh and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. How do you dwell in the land if you're moving around all the time? I don't mean within the area. But if you're, you know, if you just, you know, you just got to keep moving around the country. Delight yourself in Yahweh and he will give you the desires of your heart. Jump down to verse 7. Rest in Yahweh and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. What evil doing did we see? Even the sons let the father believe that Joseph was dead. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for Yahweh, they will inherit the land. This inheriting the land, this is not some spiritual thing that you can't wrap your mind around. This is literal, physical, terra firma, adama in the Hebrew. This is actual land that God wants to give all of you, and he wants to increase what you have. But you need to give him a, a chance to work through you, and you don't give up on him. I want to show you something. Go over to Psalm 86, Psalm 86. Psalm 86, verse 17, show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Yahweh, have helped me and comforted me. God will show your enemies a sign for good in you if you give him enough time. If your expectancy is so short that you won't let God work through you, you're not going to see the good that God wants to bring to you. God does, in fact, want to raise up those. I have a word of prophecy again. This happened to me many times this past week. I'm going to give it to you right now. God is telling me to prophesy to all of you here today and those that are watching live. If you'll let him, God will make you kings and priests. God will make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. That's, that's Deuteronomy 28. God wants to promote. There is greatness in you here this morning. Greatness that God's not done with you. Even if you're retired, Amen. God is not done with you. Amen. Amen. Let's go over to let's go over to Psalm 90, verse 91. Well, let's go over to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Verse 10. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. I, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Jump over to chapter 92, starting in verse 12. This is the one that I've been reading a lot. And it's, it's, been, it's working. I can tell you it's working. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of Yahweh. They will flourish in the courts of our God. Right. They will still yield fruit in old age. Amen. I'll read that again for those who need to turn up their hearing aids. <laughs> they will still yield fruit. In old age, they shall be full of sap and very green. Why? Verse 15 tells us why God wants to do that for you old folks. To declare that Yahweh is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Jump over to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40. We'll close it in a couple of these. Isaiah 40. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 40. Starting in verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. He gives strength to the weary. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. 
Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait, you could say wait patiently for Yahweh, will gain new strength. Not the old strength. They won't get back the old strength. They'll have new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Amen. Amen. One more. Chapter 43 of Isaiah. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. I want to tell you something, church. God's not done with this ministry or this church. We're about to explode into brand new things. We're going to be going places. And for those that want to open up their heart for power and anointing on their lives, not only are you going to see it and be happy for me and for others here, you're going to be getting a taste of it too because of what God's doing in your life. Get ready, get ready, get ready. 2019, God has told me to prophesy. I'll do it again. 2019 is going to be by far everyone's best year over every other year you've ever had. Give God the glory here this morning. Let's all stand. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Praise God. You know, I don't like to end a service without an opportunity for those that are watching live and those that are here today for you to give your hearts to Jesus Christ to just get refreshed and renewed in the Lord. If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ and you're here this morning or if you're watching live via the internet, I'd like to give you that opportunity here today. So we're going to pray here as believers. We, we all know that prayer. We're just going to repeat what's called a, what I call a sinner's prayer. And if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ and have you become brand new and have your sins washed away, just repeat these words after me. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new creation. I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap here today. Praise God. If you made that decision for the first time, see me afterwards, and I want to just give you a little booklet uh, to read. I'm going to read something I haven't read in the, in the, in, this is the Arianic Blessing. You all ready? For those of you who remember my teaching, I'm going to give it here this morning. Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, speak to the people, thus you shall bless the people. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and protect you. Yahweh deal kindly and graciously with you. Yahweh bestow his favor upon you and grant you shalom. So shall Shall they link my name with the people, and I will bless them, and we cause this thing to be done through the Messiah. His name is Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Give the God the glory one more time here today.